Hello everyone, welcome to NERV. And if this is your first time joining us, as a brief introduction, we are the Neural Engineering Research Venture, and our aim is to bring neuroscience to life in Africa and around the world. And then Siobhan and I, I'm Julianne, Siobhan and I will be your hosts for the evening, and you can look out for Darby in the comments section. Then we are very excited to share with you this evening our updated global engagement map. So NERV's global engagement continues to grow globally, and we are so happy to have each and every one of you join us. Um, yeah, so we are now, we are very happy to announce we are now reaching six continents and over 20 African countries with our global footprint. And then we also have an exciting announcement. So there is a machine learning summer school in August 2021. It will be a virtual event hosted by Taipei as part of the official MLSS series. Applications for the standard program, which allows you to submit a poster for possible selection, will close on the 20th of June 2021. So if you are interested, please do follow the link there. And Siobhan will be posting the links in the comment section. Then just a couple of house rules. Please use respectful and inclusive language on our platform. Then if you have joined us before, you will know that we usually encourage our attendees to post their questions in the Ask a Question feature. For tonight's presentation, we will handle this a little differently. So throughout our speaker's presentation, if you have any questions, please post your questions, either in the, the feature or in the comments, and then we will ask your questions as they come up. Um, yeah, so it'll be a, a more interactive event with our speaker answering the questions as they pop up during the event. Okay, and then if your connection is slow, try to refresh your browser. Alternatively, you can select the compatibility mode from the audio visual help button at the bottom of your screen. And then if your connection fails completely, the talk will be available to stream after the event. I will now hand over to Siobhan, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Julianne. And uh, thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. We're very excited to have you. Um, I will now uh, carry on with the introduction. With training in both physics and neuroscience, Theo has a, a broad interest in quantitative, quantitative solutions to all types of scientific problems. Her expertise and doctoral degree is in the field of computational neuroscience. In her biophysics of neural computation research group, they study the relationship between the physical properties of the brain and its information processing. The questions they are investigating include, how are neurons and networks form so that they can perform functions such as perception? Which characteristics of neurons and networks enhance or limit information transfer? As humans still strongly outperform machines and computers in tasks such as facial recognition or adaptations to changes in, in illumination, understanding how the brain does this can help us improve the performance of such devices. Leo's group studies these questions using a variety of theoretical methods, from biophysical neural network modeling to abstract coding models and advanced data analysis of experimental data. They collaborate closely with experimental neuroscientists studying neurons, networks, and behavior, unraveling together the fundamental functions of the brain. I will now hand over to Fleur uh, for her presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's uh, very exciting to, to be here, albeit virtually. I'm, I'm at the moment trying to find my mouse in my screen. It, uh, it has, is, ah, there it is. Um, <laughs> And I will share my screen with you so we can get started. First of all, can everyone hear me? And can everyone see my screen? Yes. 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 Loud and okay. Clear. Yeah, very good. Well, okay, then we can get started. Again, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm working at the Donners Institute of the Radboud University in uh, Nijmegen, although I'm joining you here today from Amsterdam, because that is where I'm working, um, where I'm living, my apologies. Yeah, and, and as said in the introduction, I, I do like an, an more of an interactive uh, discussion. So so don't, I cannot see the, the pose a question window, but we have uh, promised, we have made a deal that, that I will be interrupted uh, when, uh, when needed. So uh, yeah, I really hope we can get a bit of a, a lively discussion today. So um, what we will talk about today is, um, yeah, the kind of the relation between single neuron dynamics and, and network behavior, because it's kind of the, the red line, the red thread through what I do. Um, 
why yeah so basically what what i'm studying is perception and then in particular uh, sensory motor perception so sensory motor perception you have to think about um you you of course we use as humans vision a lot but suppose you you uh, enter a room with the light switched off so you cannot use your vision and you try to find a light switch so what what do you do what will you do normally well, if you think about it what you will do is you will probably make like big movements with your arm until you find a wall and then you make smaller movements to see if there's a light switch there because you know light switches are mostly on walls with Philips U and stuff today not so often anymore but and then once you find it, you make even smaller fingers uh, movements with your fingers um, to see how it works. And then you switch on the light. So basically there's two important parts of perception at play here. And one is sensory perception is that we kind of make a map of the environment uh, in our head. So we, we kind of make a map, okay, and this is the room and here I came in through a door. So there should be a, you know, a wall next to it and so on. And you know, the light switches are normally at walls, this kind of information. And then your perception is not a passive process. So you don't just you know, sit, stand in the, the doorway on, and wait until you know, magically perception comes to you. But no, you, you, you actively move around your arms and your fingers and you adjust the type of movements that you make to your image of the world. So once you know where the, where the wall is, your, your movements become smaller. And if, if you know where the light switch is, your movements are even smaller because then you know where it is. <clears throat> and we need this kind of interaction, this kind of interactive process to, to, to perform proper perception, also in vision. I mean, we might be less aware of it, but also in vision we need this. So <clears throat> of course, um, there, uh, there are certain advantages of doing uh, experiments uh, not on humans. Uh, and the good thing is that that rodents or uh, most rodents actually do the same as we do with our hands and fingers, except for they don't use their hands and fingers with it, but they use their whiskers. So um, naturally rodents like mice and, and rats, they live in, in tunnels below the ground, so they don't see that much. So they, they don't rely on vision as much as we do. And they use their whiskers in the same way as we do. And I, I had this problem last time as well that I could not start the video. Um, okay, now it's my system is hanging. Okay. Oh. Okay, let's do it that then. Is it running? No, it's not right. No, no I can only. Ah. First. Yeah, a bit of the video. I can I try it one more time. Oh, no. no. So there's something with it, the interaction with the the Crowdcast platform and the, the video that's that's not happy. Never mind. <clears throat> we'll go to the next slide if my system allows me. I had this with Crowdcast before. I don't know what this is in particular. But um it doesn't matter. What the, the, the most important point is, is that um, rodents do the same thing. So if they whisk, so they, they do this like 50 hertz whisking motion with their whiskers, but they do this with very big movements like we do in open space. But once they, they're trying to feel kind of what an object is, where it's located, what kind of texture it is, they make their movements much smaller, just like we do basically in the, um, you see it here a little bit on this other video that does work. I don't know what the, the, the problem is with that one particular video. But here you see them whisking. This is much slower because in reality they do it with 50 hertz. So you see that once they touch the object, that they that their whisker movements become much smaller. This is an experiment that we've run at the lab where an animal has to, there's two platforms with a gap in between and it has to feel where, uh, where, the, other, where the other platform is and then it jumps. Uh, and this is videoed with infrared light so they, they cannot see this. So you can see that the whisker system has also very other advantages. So it's it's similar to our sensory motor behavior. It's also relatively easy to observe. You can you can track the whiskers as you can see, and of course working with rodents has has other uh, uh, advantages such as that you can work with control neural activity with optogenetics, for instance, if you work with mice. And again, that it's a very active sense that my, mice control really the whisker position and and the movements that they make. For the, where they expect an object to be. 
well, a very a quick introduction uh, into the whisker system for those of you that are not familiar with it. So when a whisker touches an object, it curves, it bends and the curvature changes. And a, a whisker is kind of in this follicle, follicle in the skin. And then when it bends, it presses against this mechanoreceptors that surround the hair inside the skin. And the mechanoreceptors in the skin, they respond to this. <clears throat> and then and the funny thing is that the, the whole brain that processes this, in, the whole parts of the brain that processes this information are uh, organized topographically. So you see that these whiskers are, are um, located kind of in a grid-like structure on the snout of the, of the mouse of the rat in, in these rows, in this organization. And that structure has, is, is conserved throughout the processing layer. So if, if you then go to the parts of the, uh, the hindbrain and the brainstem that responds to it, the, the barrelets, then you see that they also have this, this, they have these tiny pieces that correspond, that, that respond mostly to a certain whiskers and they also have this kind of structure. And the same is true for the, thalam true for the thalamus and the same is true for the cortex. And in the cortex, we call these pieces that respond to one whisker barrels, and therefore it's often called barrel cortex, the sum of the sensory cortex in, in mice and rats. Um, <clears throat> now, if you really want to understand this kind of neural mechanisms of sensory motor control, then of course you can do this on all different levels, from, from molecules on the one hand to completely to, to human interactions on the other. Um, I will not uh, talk about all these scales today, but I will focus mostly on neurons and networks, and I will also discuss some behavior. So what I will do about and what I will start with is talk about some uh, information theory and how we analyze the, the activity of certain neurons. We will try to connect that to behavior data through network modeling. So we start with single neurons. So we know, of course, most of you that, that, that are familiar with, with neuroscience and, and computational neuroscience know that, that the, the brain, the cortex roughly consists of two types of neurons, neurons that make other neurons more active, excitatory neurons and neurons that inhibit other neurons and that we call inhibitory neurons. Now these neurons, they have a couple of different properties. So they are connected differently, for instance, the the excitatory neurons are the ones that connect between layers, between parts of the brain that really send the messages to the other layers, whereas the interneurons connect most, mostly locally, so within, within uh, areas of the brain. And interneurons basically connect to all neurons that are in the close vicinity, whereas these excitatory neurons, they connect very specifically to neurons with very specific properties. Um, and also the excitatory neurons respond to much more specific stimuli and these inhibitory neurons respond much more broadly. So this is basically a summary of this. Um, but what we do not know yet so much about is how there, there are also some intrinsic differences just in the, the, the mechanical properties of these neurons and how they influence the, the type of information they transfer. So I want to, to go a little bit deeper into this. And since I wasn't sure whether all of you are familiar with uh, information theory, I, I thought I'd, I'd do a little intermezzo on how one can measure information transfer and why we would want to in the first place. So basically, if we talk in computational neuroscience, then, you know, we generally, in neuroscience, we all have the idea that somehow uh, the brain generates activity uh, in response to, you know, its interactions with its environment. So somehow the activity of the brain has something to do with what happens in the environment, because that's that's what we neuroscientists believe. And you can basically look at this relation from two sides. Firstly, you can say, okay, stimulus goes in and then goes through all these processes and then neural activity is generated, whether you measure it with MEG or EEG or fMRI or electrodes or whatever, there is some, some neural activity then that, um, that gets generated. So that is what we typically call the encoding problem. Now you can also do the opposite. You say, okay, suppose I measured some neural activity. Can I now infer what kind of information went into the brain? So can I decode, that's why we call that the decoding problem, what stimuli a neuron or an animal got from the neural activity? Well, of course, the brain does both all the time. But in, for, for the sake of, of uh, analysis, we kind of decouple these often. So if you talk about information theory, we often talk about the decoding part. So <clears throat> we call this neural coding. There's a relation between the outside and the inside. And then you say, okay, what information does a neuron encode? 
and what information is lost, what information is discarded. So how much information is actually transferred by a neuron or by a network or by the brain? Is this something we can measure? And if so, how? And then if we, once we can measure this, then we can also start measuring this. We can start analyzing this, like what properties in a neuron make a neuron more selective or make uh, transfer more information or less, or maybe there are certain circumstances, certain neuromodulators, certain situation where a neuron processes more or less information. So this is, we have to measure this first before we can start analyzing it. Now, if we talk about <clears throat> information, then we of course talk about Claude Shannon. There's on the resources page I shared you, there's a, a link to a, a video from Ian, Mac Ian Magazine, I think I pronounced that correctly, which is really great. I, I, I suggest you walk, uh, watch it because it really gives you the introduction of information theory and what, what Claude Shannon did. did. But the basics of this are this, and I found this, I must say, quite confusing when it came from physics because it, it uses all the methods of, of statistical physics, but the interpretation is very different. So if we, in information theory, if we talk about entropy, then we talk about surprise. So basically, if I say, if I throw a die, how surprising is a six? Of course, that depends on how many sides the die had. If it's a 20 sided die, then it's much more surprising than if the die had only three sides or what uh, if it's it's a, like a, a die that it always six and it's not surprising at all so it has to do something with the the probability of a six now to quantify surprise and this is where it comes is okay surprise has to be positive i, I wouldn't know what a, a negative surprise would be it has to decrease with the probability with the likelihood and it has to be it, it has to sum properly. So two independent events that have a certain surprise, then their sum should be just the sum of the surprises. Now, the only function that follows these three rules is actually the log function, the logarithm, the, the natural, you use the natural logarithm, often, often the binary logarithm, the log two is used, but you could also use a natural logarithm, then you don't use bits, but nets, some people do that. So you can see the, the, the definition of surprise is the, the, the probability of an event happening times the log of the probability of that event happening, and then that sums over all possible events. So let's take a, a look at a couple of examples. So a die with 20 sides has a higher entropy, a higher surprise, and a die with six sides. And a fair coin toss has a higher, higher entropy than an unfair one, because it's less surprising what happens. So the entropy measures the variability or the surprise or the uncertainty. So for one die, I can just easily calculate it. So every number of, of proper die, everyone has a, has a probability of one sixth. So the entropy is six times one sixth times log two of one sixth, which is 2.6 bits. So an, uh, and a die has an entropy of 2.6 bits. Now, if you have two dice that you throw independently, well, you have 36 combinations, so it's the same calculation, and you get the 5.2 bit, which is indeed exactly 2 times 2.6. So indeed, it sums properly. <clears throat> now, so what you see here is that in a, indeed, independent variables, they just their, their entropy is just a sum. But what if two variables are not independent, but they depend on one another? Basically, one, when one um, variable influences the other, then you could see that actually you could actually say that you know this one variable then knows something about the other it has some information about the other so if they share if they are dependent somehow then they share some information and that is exactly where the definition of information comes from so basically if you see the circle here if you have two um, variables that are not independent that depend on that one another then their joint entropy becomes smaller. And by how much, this is just the definition of, of joint entropy. You can see it's just the, the, the definition with an extra dimension of uh, as the same as the normal entropy. But you can see that it becomes smaller, that the joint entropy becomes smaller than the sum of the entropy when the two variables are dependent. And by how much does it become smaller? That is exactly what we call information. 
So mutual information, it's always between two variables. You say, I know something about, if I know one variable, then I also know something about the other variable. That is what I call information. And that is then what I, that's a reduction in entropy. So if, for instance, here the blue circle would respond to all the possible inputs to the brain, and the, all the neural activity, all the possible neural activity would be represented by the red circle, then all input output combinations are represented by the two circles together, and there in the middle is the mutual information. So another way, how I often think about mutual information is just, it's just an advanced way of measuring cor correlation. If two variables have some sort of relation, then there's information between the two. And why is it more advanced? Well, this is a very nice picture, just from Wikipedia. You see that in the bottom row, there's a lot of, um, there's some, there's two variables that, that clearly have a relation, but where their correlation would always be zero, just because of the shape of the relation. And the mutual information actually would be able to pick this up. But mutual information is just, if you say it very bluntly, it's just a very fancy way of measuring a correlation, quote unquote. So <clears throat> back to the brain. So if I'm interested in how biophysical properties of the brain for instance, the conductances in a neuron, how they influence information processing, or how, how much information is lost once a spike is generated, then I, I want to measure the, 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 the joint probability distribution of all the input that goes into a neuron and then all the possible outcomes, all the spike trains. Now, if I do this in an in vitro setup, then I have a couple of um, uh, yeah, confinements. And one of them is that cells, for instance, stay alive for about one hour. And that in this one hour, you want to, for instance, uh, compare multiple settings. So for instance, the application of a neuromodulator or a drug or different uh, protocols that you want to use or how the in input properties change. And you want to give a kind of a naturalistic stimulus for a neuron. So you don't want to use a, a, a stimulus that's very strange for a neuron. Well, people have been doing this already since the well late 80s and 90s, in, in particular, Rob de Ruyter van Stevening and William Bialek and Frederike. So they, they came up traditionally with two methods. One is the is it follows. You say, okay, I here they 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 um, measured the activity of a single neuron in a blowfly. I, I still think that's amazing that you can actually get an electrode into a blowfly, but that's a, one other thing. And they show it a random moving patterns. So here you can you can see in 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 dark black you can see uh, the, the 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 movement direction of the. Uh, of the, the input, and, they, and then they measure, the, they record the spike train and say, okay, can I now infer the input from the spiking activity of the spike train? And what they did is they did a, a, a inverse correlation technique. So they, they, they fitted a model of, of the relation, and then they could make an estimate of how this worked. And the is that fitting that model is something that is very complicated because you have to kind of find the, the you have to measure all input output there, so you have to, to have that happen multiple times. So you need one hour of recordings. And that's all good and nice, but we just saw that in, in, in our recordings often, uh, neurons only stay alive for one hour. So then you have one number and then you're done. Uh, similarly, uh, the, the same people, or largely the same people came up with another way but they say, okay, if I now take a shorter stimulus, but we repeat it a lot of times, then we kind of can measure the signal to noise ratio. And you can imagine that there is also a relation between the signal to noise ratio and, and, the, and the information, because the noisier a system is, the less information you have about what happened. And again, there's, there's a, 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 you can do this, you can, um, you can relate in, in under certain assumptions the, the signals to noise ratio to the information, the mutual information. But the problem again is that you need so many repetitions to get a, a proper estimate that you need an hour of it. <clears throat> so basically, the, the problem was that classical methods need about one hour for a single information estimate, and we don't have that much time. So we developed a new method. So it was Sophie Deneuve and Boris Gutkin uh, in France and me in uh, at the time also in Paris, and then Witze Batman and Siko de Knecht in Amsterdam that did the, the experiments for us, that we developed this method of doing, of, of getting it in a shorter time. So what we did basically is this noisy stimulus they normally use, instead of um, just giving this noisy stimulus, it's being generated by an artificial neural network, as you can see here. 
And this artificial neural network relate, uh, did it in response to a binary stimulus. So you give the artificial neural network a binary stimulus, it's either on or off, then the artificial neural network generates spikes and thereby an input, and then you give that input to the neuron and you record its spike train. Now, the advantage is that instead of relating the spike train to this very high dimensional, basically fluctuating input, you can just relate it to the binary input now, to the zero or one uh, status. So the entropy basically of your input is much lower, so you can measure the information much faster. And that is basically <clears throat> by making, uh, by using these artificial neural networks, we can control basically how much of the information is already in the input that the neurons get and then the information in the output can be estimated in about five minutes instead of one hour um, and you don't need trial repetitions and you don't to fit a decoding model. so that was uh, one uh, yeah that that helped us a lot in measuring uh, this kind of information in, in single neurons so um, we are actually, at the moment, I have a student, Nick Schutte, that is actually making a dynamic clamp implementation of this as well. It's, it's almost done. Um, I'm very proud of it. Um, so the idea about this is that in experiments, it's actually kind of, in vitro experiments, it's kind of an unnatural situation for a neuron. Because a neuron is, the whole network is quiet. Whereas in vivo, in a, in a living animal, a neuron actually gets all the time bombarded with synaptic input from all the other neurons in the network. So you have a depolarized membrane potential, the membrane potential fluctuates a lot, and the input resistance is much lower. So you can mimic this by using a dynamic clamp. And with that, you inject, instead of injecting current, you inject conductances. You do that with a little feedback loop. I'm not going to go much into the details, but it's, it's a technique that exists now, exists now for 20 years, 30 years. So you, you hook up a little computer that basically calculates the current that should be injected based on the current membrane potential. And by that, you mimic a conductivity instead of uh, a current. And that works too. So we, uh, yeah, we started doing these experiments and we have by now more than 850 recordings of almost 300 neurons from adult mice in the barrel cortex. Uh, and we have shared this data actually already, uh, or at least part of it on, on the Giga Science data set. So you can take a, take a look at it if you want, if you can use it, it's uh, free for everyone to use. You can also <clears throat> find it in the Data without borders explorer, they have uh, put it in there. So and anyone is free to use it. So what can we now find if we start measuring all these neurons with this method? So here you see uh, an, an, uh, an example, you see an excitatory neuron and an inhibitory neuron. We had to slightly change the input in these neurons because uh, inhibit excitatory neurons um, in the cortex, they just don't spike that much. So I poor Nicolo Calcini, who did all this work, he came to me and we started these experiments. He said, yeah, the neurons don't spike more than three hertz. I said, okay, increase the amplitude. So yeah, they still don't spike more than a few hertz. Said, okay, increase the bias, but no. So we had to, but fortunately with this method, we can do that. We can make the input very slower, but keep the amount of information in, in the input the same. So we can still uh, compare the inhibitory and the excitatory neurons. So this is a little bit the input that you see in gray and white on top, you see the, the hidden state, whether it's on or off. You see in black, you see the, the current that we injected, and below in red and blue, you see the for excitatory and inhibitory result in membrane potentials and the spikes. Um, and then we can measure how much information is transferred with these neurons. And to our surprise, we found that inhibitory neurons transfer more information than excitatory neurons. So here on the left, you see the, 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 the transferred information is a function of the normalized firing rate, so we can compare them properly. You see that the, the amount of information inhibitory neurons transfer is higher. On the right, you see a operator curve, which is kind of a traditional way of, um, of also measuring information. So you see the, the amount of hits, so the amount of spikes when the hidden state was one as a function of the false alarm, so that the, the, the wrong spikes, the errors, with the spike when the hidden state was zero. You see again that the, the blue curve is basically more towards the, the top left corner, which is also a, a, a sign that it's, you can discriminate stimulus better with the, <clears throat> with the in, inhibitory neurons, the excitatory neurons. And that surprised me because 
the inhibitory neurons are the ones that connect only locally, whereas the excitatory neurons are the ones that connect between networks, that send the messages between networks. So I would have initially thought the opposite. Now, this goes hand in hand with, uh, with a higher threshold for the excitatory neurons, which is maybe not so surprising because they, they fire also at lower rates, so they have a much higher threshold. Um, yeah, so if we take this together with what we saw before, he said it's kind of funny because these neurons that actually send the messages between layers, between networks, they have less information about the stimulus than the ones that connect only locally. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, what does it mean? And if you think about it a bit more, but this is of course just interpretation and speculation for me, it could be that, for instance, that the, the excitatory neurons have very specific messages that they want to send uh, to the other to the other layers, and that the inhibitory neurons actually um, gate the messages that that decides which of the excitatory neurons is allowed to send a message at any moment in time. And then, of course, they need to kind of know what's happening in the network, so they need to have more information than the very specific excitatory neurons have. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, Fleur, just a, a quick question. Uh, were you comparing different areas in the brain, or is this no. uh, like a No, this is result? all just barrel cortex. This is all layer okay. two, three of uh, barrel cortex. Yeah. No, so the, the conclusion might be very different from other areas in the brain. I can completely imagine that your conclusion would be different in, from thalamus or hippocampus, for instance. That it might be might be the same result. I uh, I would not, but I can I can very well imagine that be doing. But you would have to do it for that, of course, to <laughs> to yeah. know. You, know, you have to measure that. It is a good it's a good point. Um, yeah. So that gives us kind of a a hint of what these neurons are doing. Now we can also measure what, for instance, a neuromodulator like dopamine would do. So Xuan Yang uh, did a couple of these experiments in our lab uh, at the Department of Neurophysiology. And you can see here that actually uh, you, uh, in blue, the inhibitory neurons, there you see on the vertical axis, the change in information transfer and on the horizontal axis, the change in uh, firing frequency. And you see that the inhibitory neurons actually increase both the firing frequency and their uh, transferred information. Whereas for the excitatory neurons, it's it's kind of hard to tell. They're kind of all over the place. And you see that um, if you look at the middle figure, you see that actually the, the, the dopamine, it's they, they stay on the same curve, these inhibitory neurons. They just move on the curve more towards the right. So they fire more and higher at the right times. And you see uh, the same for the excitatory neurons. We cannot really draw a conclusion from those. And you also see that the dopamine actually decreases the threshold of the inhibitory neurons. So if we put that again in our little tables, that the dopamine, or the D, D1 agonist in this case, has very variable effects on the neurons, but for inhibitory neurons, it actually increases their firing rate and their information transfer. So maybe their, their gating becomes more strict, for instance. Okay, <clears throat> so that is what I wanted to tell you about single neurons. Now let's go to completely at the, to the other side of our scale. Is there a question? Yeah, just a, a, a quick one um, uh, about uh, the direct comparison between the, the input you're giving to the network uh, yeah. co compared to the in vivo, ex the in vivo activity. Yeah. Uh, how comparable is this? Um, <clears throat> Well, of course, uh, because uh, who knows under all circumstances what a what all neurons get. So the, 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 the real answer is that um, we don't know exactly. I mean, of course, I don't, I didn't take any dendrites into account, for instance, here. So what arrives at the soma is also filtered uh, to a strong extent by, you know, on what dendrite it comes in and how these dendrites are shaped. I mean, there's very, uh, there's being done very interesting um, on, on, on dendritic computation by uh, Jota Forazi, Roman Kaze, and some some others. So yeah, I mean, there's of course uh, there's there's the dendrites happening, and but to a certain extent, we we don't know. I mean, we know that this this bombardment is going on, so that it's it's a fluctuating uh, input that they get, and that that it's relatively a lot of of input. But what the exact for instance, statistical nature of it is is just very hard to tell. So it's a good question. Uh, but it's one of the things that we just don't know exactly. So we, we try to mimic it as good as we can, but um, but yeah, we don't know exactly. 
might also not be the same for all neurons. I mean, it might be that, that there are certain subclasses that, that receive different types of input. Thanks. <clears throat> so if we now go completely to the other side, to the, to the behavior of these animals, um, here you see again that gap crossing task I, I, uh, I just talked to you about, uh, where a, a rodent has to jump to another platform. Uh, it has to feel with its whiskers where the other platform is, and then it jumps. Um, we've done we've done a lot of experiments uh, with this. Also, again, we shared this through a database, so everyone can uh, can look at the videos and, and use their favorite tracking device to to see what's happening here. Um, <clears throat> and what we find is that if you actually then inject, we have these micro injectors, uh, dopamine into the bare cortex then, or D1 agonist again, my apologies, then you see that on every scale, so what, however we measure it, whether it's the amount of touches, how long it waits to cross, whether how many times it has to touch, um, we see that an animal decreases that. So it basically jumps quicker. You could say it becomes more daring, or it, it needs less evidence before it comes. So we see that D1 agonist on, um, in the barrel cortex on the single neuron level has very strong effects on, in particular, inhibitory neurons. And on the behavioral level, changes the behavior of these animals. So how, how do we connect these two? How do we connect these two observations? Well, for this, we have to understand what happens in the network. Networks that consist of this, of this uh, of these neurons. Because of course, until now, I completely ignored kind of in the, the, the that I showed you that these neurons are part of a network. So <clears throat> basically, we have to make models of how we think the networks are doing uh, what they are doing in the brain and how this is influenced then by, for instance, dopamine or D1 agonist. So how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> you can you can start from the small side, so you can small neurons or more extended neurons. I, I just talked about dendritic rotations or uh, the, the effect, for instance, there's also effects well known of the axon initial segment, how it is shaped. So I had a couple of students working on that, taking these data uh, points and uh, taking these, these, these recordings and try to fit neurons to it. And then you can make these into small networks. So you can, for instance, look at the difference between uh, feed forward and feedback inhibition. Just connect two neurons together and see how this how this would work if I if I decrease the, the threshold of a single inhibitory neuron, for instance. That's still work in progress. One thing is that that I can tell you is that we really tried. Okay, can we link this to one to one particular channel? So sodium inactivation, for instance, or a potassium channel, or the mechanics of one particular type of channel in the membrane, and we couldn't. So we could find, funnily enough, we have all these experiments and we try to fit the effects of dopamine. We could fit the effects in firing rate. We could fit models that indeed decrease their firing rate, but we could not link this by a single parameter. And this fits actually very well with the work of Eve Marder and others that say, well, maybe, maybe there is not one solution. Maybe different neurons uh, find different ways, different, sol different uh, solutions to the same problem, is that they need to increase their firing rate in their information transfer, but maybe one does it by having a longer sodium inactivation and the other one having more potassium channels. There's, maybe they do it in different ways. Um, <clears throat> we can also go to bigger networks, of course. So here's the, uh, a very important work by Chao Huang, who painstakingly uh, reconstructed the whole barrel with different stainings of different types of neurons. So he really located where all these neurons are and made this into a model. Uh, that model is also on the, um, you can find it, it's freely available. It's on, also on the open source brain, for instance. Um, so he really located all these neurons and said, okay, let's make it a reconstructed neuron model. Um, and what can we, can we use this then for? Well, we, um, we saw, okay. yes. Sorry, so we have another question here. Yes, well, um, don't be sorry. The, okay, the question mm -hmm. is from Ashmin, who wants to know, does Hitt's law factor into increased speed in prediction here? Say that again, sorry, I didn't hear it properly. Does Hebb's law factor into Hebb's increased law. speed in prediction? Yes. Um, so 
you mean uh, Hebb's law in increased speed? In Hebb's law is typically, of course, you know, the, the neurons that fire together. That's something that is thought to occur relatively. I'm, I'm thinking about how to answer this because it's, um, it's I think, thought to work at different time scales. So, so Hebb's law is, of course, that that neurons that that tend to, you know, form a connection that they get, uh, that that you know, are active together, uh, form a stronger connection. Whereas this is more the the effect of dopamine that we saw in these neurons is more of a single neuron effect that we see that every single neuron increases or decreases its firing rate. Of course, this could have a strong effect on the learning. The hard part is that we uh, there's more there's a lot of evidence on how kind of heavy and learning works for excitatory neurons for inhibitory neurons people are working on it but there's much less known about kind of heavy and learning for inhibitory neurons so it would be i, I would um, be hesitant to say anything definitive about what would happen with heavy and learning on for instance the effect of if you increase the firing rate of, of in it could have an effect, so it could influence learning. I, I could very well imagine that it does have some effect, but I, I wouldn't dare to say what it. I hope that a bit of an answer. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so what we saw in, um, so we did uh, also some some uh, a combination of in vitro and in vivo experiments where we move a single whisker, and then you see how much information is there. Uh, at the input of the neuron, so basically the EPSP, the, 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 the input that the neuron gets in the barrel cortex upon moving the whisker, and how much information is there in the spiking of that neuron. So basically, you say how much information is there in the input to the neuron, and how much information is there in the output of the neuron. And you see that there's a strong, strong loss in information. So a neuron receives in barrel cortex almost all information about the, the, the whisker activity, even though it is several layers away from, from you know, you have, you've, it's gone through the, from the receptor to the, to the brain stem, to the thalamus, and then through layer four of the cortex, and then in layer three, but still you see that there's almost all information is there, whereas in the spiking, a lot of the information is lost. You can see that it's, it's much lower. Um, what we then see is that if we build this, if we look at this reconstructed network, we can replicate this. This is something that we see as well. So the, the, um, the, the connectivity that we reconstructed actually shows this as well. And that in this case, <clears throat> the, in, the inhibitory neurons have slightly less info in the input that they get, but there's again more information in the spikes that they send out to the local network. So again, the inhibitory neurons have more information than the excitatory neurons. Now, how much um, cells are needed for, for instance, full information recovery? So, how many, how many, a big of a group of how many cells do you need before <clears throat> all information is recovered again? Well, that depends a bit on, on how you do it. So, on how you assume the brain operates, whether it stores information in the timing of spikes or in the firing rates of the neurons. So these are all assumptions that you have to make, and they influence your results. But as a, a rule of thumb, you need tens of neurons to recover the full stimuli information. Which is, if you think about it, not that much. Given that we have billions of neurons in the brain, tens of neurons to, to recover full stimulus information is not that much. So <clears throat> these are the more biophysical network models that we have. So a last thing I want to talk to you about is now. Oh, uh, sorry, just a, yeah. a quick question on that note. Um, is this uh, what, what sort of advantage is there to this information loss and then it being recovered by so many neurons? Is it like energy efficiency mm. or? It's a, that's a very good question, and and I can speculate. I mean, I have some ideas about it. Again, that's that's speculation on my side, but um, of course you don't want if you if you would from layer to layer just, you know, send full information and your brain wouldn't be doing anything <laughs> if you would just, you know, have all the info. So it needs, of course, all the time to, to do computations and to make a selection of what information it should keep and is relevant for the animal and what information is, uh, is something that it can discard or that is discarded for a certain task. I mean, of course, the, there's a lot coming in and different processes might require different information. 
but uh, but at least some of it needs to be kept and some of them needs to be discarded. And I think what the brain is doing is is maybe roughly a coordinate transformation into you know if you can say okay now it can it separates out things that are important for certain tasks and things that are important for other tasks. And then, for instance, if you have a group of neurons that that get the information that's important for a certain task and a group of neurons that's important for another task, they both discard a lot of information, so they lose a lot of information. But if you combine them again, you get the full information again. But the next process, the next process in the brain just taps into the ones that's interesting for that process. But I think I, my guess would be that the brain is doing something like that. I hope that makes sense. Though. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so now we actually with that become kind of naturally into coding models. So we can make theories about you know, what is the brain doing? Um, and then you talk about coding models. And these are, what kind of computations is the brain doing to do things like perception or, you know, decide to jump to another platform? <clears throat> so basically how is information represented in the brain and how do these biological properties, these network properties and these neural properties contribute to it? Do they help it? Do they harm it? In what situation uh, do they need to do what? Uh, and if you talk about these more like theoretical models, I think at the moment there are three main, I'd say, theories in computational neuroscience. And it sort of started all with uh, balanced networks and with from, uh, Carl van Vreeswijk and Chaim Sompolinski and Nicola Brunel that showed that if you have a network with random connectivity that consists of excitatory and inhibitory neurons of a, in a like one to four ratio, and you balance their synaptic strength, they show this chaotic behavior. Uh, and that looks very much like the kind of behavior that you see if you just you know record from the from the from the cortex. So that the, 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 the activity from these cells, if you look at the in vivo situation, it looks very random, very chaotic. And you can make that very well, not simply, but you can make that by just connecting them randomly and balancing their the, the synaptic strength between the excitatory and the, and the inhibitory neurons. But of course, these networks then don't do anything yet. I mean, they, you show like in a, in a physics kind of way how these network kind of balance in other, each other and how they stay in equilibrium, but you don't know what they're doing. Now, how can you do something with these networks? And Barnberg and Kumar, they, they actually wrote a nice paper about this two years ago. They say there's actually two main theories. One of them is called reservoir computing. You also hear sometimes forest learning. But you say, okay, we just let this network do its whatever its chaotic behavior is, and then you train an output, kind of a readout, um, to do a certain task. Uh, and then you can, these networks can learn to perform tasks by just training the readout. And then you can, of course, wonder, like, what, what is, the, and, and all these, these randomly connected network is called your reservoir, hence reservoir computing. You can wonder, like, what kind of properties does this reservoir need to have for it to work or not? And <clears throat> Sophie de Neve uh, and, and Christian Machens actually propose kind of the opposite theory. They say, well, if I do the opposite, if I start from the other perspective and I say, okay, what I want to do is linear decoding. So I, I force my decoder on the network, I force my network to perform a certain task, um, then, um, and if I force it, then the result then I get, then, then my, my connectivity is kind of set already, then it's, stuck because if I say this is the task you have to do optimally then that results in a certain connectivity that actually shows variability and a balance and um, a chaotic, chaotic activity so this balance is actually a result of efficient coding so even though it these two theories they they're almost indistinguishable they're very it would be very hard to design an experiment that see see the difference between these two cases because you both have kind of a a connected reservoir with an output, an output de a decoder, a, 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 something that reads the activity. In one, you say, okay, this network is designed almost to do a certain task, and the result is this kind, this tight uh, balance of excitation and inhibition, and this kind of chaotic, um, this ca kind of chaotic activity. Whereas in the other way, you said, okay, this network is doing whatever, and I'm training the output weight. So your perspective on it is very different. Now. <clears throat> In my lab, we're trying to 
combine all three perspectives to, to see what it would bring us, where would it take us. So we measured, like I saw, like I showed you this reconstructed network. Actually, what we saw is that you don't really, in, in barrel cortex, you don't have the four to one balance ratio of excitatory inhibitory neurons, but the, the ratios are actually slightly different. And also the connectivity is not random, but it's local. There's kind of these patterns in it. So how do these deviations influence in them? Um, in network activity. And then what you see is that your network becomes a little bit more, um, becomes a little bit more synchronized than it would be otherwise. So the neuron ratio kind of plays a similar role as the coupling strength. Now, and if you want to then start letting these networks do something, you can, for instance, do force learning. We had one student doing that. So he, he took uh, some, some data from uh, Karel Svoboda's lab where you have had fixed mouse uh, detecting, an, uh, detecting a pole, whether it's close by or far away, and see if the uh, forest learning network could train that with hopefully realistic properties like we saw before. Um, and we actually did a benchmark with a deep learning network. Um, and you can see that um, you can do it. it. With a deep learning network, you can get like 80% correct. So this is doable. In our forest training, it was sometimes correct and sometimes not. And we're still trying to figure out exactly why it's not. So sometimes it can learn it and sometimes not. We have the idea it's something to do with the activity staying balanced. So the relation between some, somehow with this force training, it gets out of its balance regime and it doesn't work properly anymore. But we're still looking at it. Um, and then the last one. Before, also you, we, before yes. you continue here, yeah. we have another question. Yes. Um, so the question, is maintaining informational content alone doesn't seem to yes. lead to actual task solving. Can information no. theory tell us something about goal directedness? No, I mean, it's it's true. I mean, um, the, 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 uh, actually, information theory only tells you whether it's good or not at, at doing a certain task, but not um, in itself. Well, it, it, information theory only tells you whether there's a relation between you know, what comes in and what goes out. Um, not about, for instance, what the computation is that's happening in between. So that is where you need models or theories. If you say, okay, now my theory is that, you know, this kind of computation is happening in the brain in a network and you make a model of that. And then you can say, okay, this is, this is the result. The result of that is actually something that looks like what I record in the brain or it looks completely different. And, and measuring the information between what comes in and what goes out is one way of testing that. But in the end, it's more of a, like, just like measuring a membrane potential doesn't tell you how, how well a network is training a task. Does measuring the, the information doesn't also tell you that by itself. But it's one of the measures that you can use to basically um, compare networks, for instance, or their, their performance. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so the last bit, the last theory, basically, uh, we use this um, efficient coding paradigm perspective to say, okay, if I, if I create a network, I will not go into the details, but I didn't want to keep them from you either. <laughs> if I create a network so I can use it as a linear decoder, so I give it an input and I want this network with the linear decoder actually to give the exact same back. So it's a, a very boring network. It basically does nothing. It just gives you exactly what came in. Um, and you say, okay, I want to do this in an as efficient way as possible. So I say, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I minimize the mean squared error between the input and the output. And I want to do this with as few spikes as possible. How, what, how would I set up my network? Well, you can do a bit of math, and I, like I said, I'm not going to do in the in the go into the details, but it's math you can do. And then what you find is that you have a network with a certain tight recurrence connectivity, where each neuron represents a different a different feature, a different stimulus. Ha each neuron has a different receptive field, so to speak. And then, <clears throat> but once you've set what each neuron's receptive field is, basically you're done. Then the whole network and it's and it's a recurrent connectivity is set uh, once you've said, okay, what this network needs to do, these are these are the receptive fields, 
and it needs to minimize the mean squared error between input and output in a greedy way, then your network is done. It's set. It's a mathematical derivation that you can do. And the activity, the resulting activity of the network has a strong trial to trial variability. It has a strong balance ex of excitation and, and inhibition. It's very robust to noise and to cell death, for instance. And it's very efficient. And the funny thing is that we tested whether a homogeneous network, where basically all the neurons do the same thing, is more efficient or ever robust than a heterogeneous network. And the answer is no. You can better have a heterogeneous network than a homogeneous network. So all, if all the neurons are doing slightly, something slightly different, are slight, are, have slightly different properties, code for slightly different things, have slightly different receptive fields, your network <clears throat> is much more efficient and much more robust against noise. And the funny thing is that the try to try variability actually decreases with this efficiency. So the more efficient your network is, the less trial to try variability you have. So <clears throat> with that, I've come to my conclusion. So we've looked at how the intrinsic properties of excitatory and inhibitory neurons influence their information transfer. And you see that we saw that information uh, inhibitory neurons are more broadband, they have high firing rates, whereas excitatory neurons are more sparse, and inhibitory neurons send more information than excitatory neurons. And dopamine, or D1 agonist, increases the information transfer of inhibitory neurons and not of excitatory neurons. And behaviorally, results this results in faster information integration of animals. Now, how to bridge this gap? Therefore, we have to understand the network level. And we saw that tens of neurons are needed to recover the full stimulus information, that realistic deviations from random connectivity uh, determine the activity of balanced networks, that uh, in force learning, we saw that the, the performance depends on actually keeping this balance, and that heterogeneity, so that all neurons code for different things, increases the efficiency and robustness of efficient coding networks. And the trial to trial variability is actually a sign of this. And I call this here degenerate coding. And what I mean with that is again, a little bit what the, the, the philosophy of what Eve Marder and others say is that if a network has to find a solution and it's good that it can basically find multiple ways to the same, to the same uh, goal, to the same objective. If it has only one way of solving a problem, then once this one way pulls out for some reason, then you're done. You cannot do this anymore. Whereas if you if you have like 10 different ways of solving a problem, then if one if you cannot use one anymore, it doesn't matter. And this is something that you see a lot in biological systems that you know different systems, different parts of a system find different ways to solve the same problem. And by that, the system becomes very, very robust and very sometimes also very efficient. So that's probably a, a, a principle that is that is uh, important in biological networks that to be adaptive in different types of environments and against, for instance, cell death or other forms of uh, things that could go wrong. It's good to have a very degenerate way of, of doing it so that you can always find different paths. Um, yeah, and with that, I want to end. I, there's a lot of people I have to I have to thank uh, people that gave me money, obviously, to do all of this people that collaborated with me. Um, yeah, and all the people that did the experiments did a lot of the hard work. I want to mention one thing, we're still hiring at SmartNets. Unfortunately, not in my lab, uh, or not unfortunately, we already found three very good PhD students. But uh, in SmartNets, we're kind of solving these kind of problems that I talked about. Uh, we're, we're collaborating with uh, six institutes, different PIs, and there are still a couple of these PhDs PhD positions available. So if you find this interesting and you're looking for a PhD, please apply. I know that, for instance, in Ghent, they're still looking. I think in Paris, they're still looking. Uh, they, in, uh, in Greece, they might still be looking. I'm actually not sure. Uh, and in Germany also. So yes, please let me know if you're interested in these kind of problems. And with that, I would uh, yeah, like to end this, uh, this conversation. And I'm more than happy to take any of your questions. I'm only warning you, I have 7% of battery left. So if I suddenly fall out, 
then I will come back with my iPad, but then I, I'm, I'm gone for like a few minutes and then I will come back. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Claire. It was a wonderful talk. Very, very interesting. Um, it seems like we have run through most of our questions during your talk. Um, yeah, so so I think maybe with the the battery dying soon and my <laughs> power cuts on my end, <laughs> it might be a good place to to call it a also, night. Um, also, your battery ending. Oh no! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, everyone, I apologise for my lack of light. We do have power cuts in South Africa at the moment. Um, but yes, thank you so much for for joining us online tonight, Flirt. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, and thank you to all of you also for joining. So let's give uh, a um, round of applause in the comments just to show our appreciation. Thank you so much. And, and also thank you for the nice questions. It's very fun to, it's so weird to talk to yourself all the time. So it's so nice to get a question every now and then to, you know, actually get a little bit of a feeling of who you're talking to. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's great. It feels it feels odd to interrupt you, but it's a nice interactive, interactive experience then at least. <laughs> Um, like yeah, thank so thank you, you so to much. all of you for, for joining us online. And then also do remember to subscribe to Nerves mailing list and calendar. The links will be posted in the comments. Siobhan will share those with you. And thank you for attending. And then hopefully we will see you at our next event. And with that, we say thank you. goodbye and good night. <laughs> and good luck in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye.